Today we're doing some deconstruction of literature. Wait, what's that? Not, not this kind of deconstruction? Like the, like the critical kind? I even brought a saw. Oh no. well. Anyway, I guess we'll do the other kind of deconstruction of literature. Uh, welcome back to the classroom. This is video lecture four. Deconstruction is not only one of my favorite pastimes when it comes to books or, you know, pieces of lumber. It's also a way of examining literature. It's a type of lens that we use to examine it. Um, for instance, if uh, Tina Belcher was a lens that we used to examine literature, we'd use, um, well, I guess we'd view solely horses, zombies, and butts. In today's video, we're going to look at about one and a half of those three things. It won't be weird. Well, I hope it's not. I promise, it won't be that weird. Deconstructionism is a response to new criticism, another type of lens that loves binaries and therefore loves heart of darkness. Binaries are opposite images in a piece of literature set together, like savagery and civilization, nature and industry, good and bad, black and white, rich and poor, up and down, etc. As you've probably seen in past videos, many of these binaries are present in heart of darkness, which is why new critics love the work. Um, However, deconstructionists don't, and you might ask yourself, with all the war and poverty and bad customer service in the world, why would anyone set up their beef with binaries? The reason? Because readers are always biased toward one binary. Good is always better than bad, rich is always better than poor, white is better than black, up is even better than down. Uh, you can see how a novel that juxtaposes a black African society with a white European one um, would make some deconstructionists a little uneasy. Uh, that binary Conrad uses all the time, and if we're always thinking black is bad, it clearly uh, should ring some uh, racially sensitive bells, so to speak. This brings us to our big question. Does Conrad's use of black Africans as the second half of a binary set up to examine white Europeans' actions in Africa make the novel racist? The answer, absolutely it does. Chinua Achibi, one of the greatest writers of the 20th century and Nigerian's greatest ever novelist, really wasn't too fond of Heart of Darkness. I'm going to read you a quote um, from his essay, An Image of Africa. He says that Conrad uses Africa as merely the antithesis of Europe, and that no matter how pretty his prose, he's still a bloody racist. That's a direct quote there, bloody racist. Now, I encourage you to read more of Achibi's work on your own time. However, for our purposes, let's go ahead and stay rooted in our text. Um, is the black and white binary Conrad sets up racist? Uh, absolutely, it is. Uh, is his descriptions of Africans cringe inducing? Um, absolutely, yep, uh, it should be. Uh, is the novel still worthy of study? Without a doubt. As Carly Phillips, another scholar, writes, it is nonsensical to demand of Conrad to imagine an African humanity that is totally out of line with both the times he was living and the larger purpose of his novel. It is that larger purpose that I hope to examine in this video. Um, however, I need to use the bathroom now, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, pause here for a nice uh, cutscene. There are two main events that start uh, this second chapter of the novel. The first starts with Marlowe asleep on the, the deck of his steamer, and he all of a sudden hears some voices. Thankfully, me and Charlie, my top plant expert, caught some um, reenactment footage that we thought we'd want to show you. I think it'll make it a little bit clearer what's, what's going on. Ah, oh, the chair again. Oh, my. That was right in the kneecap. Okay. Dangerous work walking through the Congo. All right. Panning down, panning down. Oh, look it, there's the African, Charlie. Oh, that's what I get for taking you to the bathroom with me. Uh, there's the African jungle. Oh, look it, man, oh, man, oh, I'm so sleepy. My name is Marlo, I'm on this steamboat and I'm sleepy. Wait, wait, is that voices down there? It is, oh my gosh, it's a skinny but healthy manager and a fat uncle who's also the leader of the El Dorado exploring expedition. Let me listen to what they're going to say. I won't catch the whole conversation because Joseph Conrad writes in a way where we only get little pieces of the puzzle at a time. Okay, here we go. Hi, skinny uh, nephew who's only the manager because he's healthy. Um, I heard you have a problem with someone. I sure do, fat uncle who's the leader of the terrible people known as the El Dorado Exploring Expedition. Uh, what advice do you have for me? 
Uh, get him hanged. Why not? Anything can be done in this country. You mean kill him? Yes. No one will find out. Use the savagery around you. Become darkness itself and kill people in your way. Thanks for the great advice, fat uncle. Do, 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 do. Wow. Oh, man. Europeans colonizing Africa and acting terribly. What a surprise. That uncle doesn't last much longer, though, as Marlow tells us. In a few days, the El Dorado ex expedition went into the patient wilderness that closed upon it as the sea closes over a diver. Long afterwards, the news came that all the donkeys were dead. I know nothing as to the fate of the less valuable animals. They, no doubt, like the rest of us, found what they deserved. So, Marlowe refers to the fat uncle and his compatriots as the less valuable animals. Less valuable than a donkey. What's basically like half a horse. And what is referred to is a, is a not so nice name for the human buttocks. Sorry, donkey enthusiast, but I told you we would cover one and a half of these today. So, I hope that, uh... <laughs> that weird cutscene didn't make the fact that I was getting a call I had to take too obvious. Anyway, we're back. Uh, last little section here. I want you to compare um, these uh, sub-butt Europeans uh, with the Africans Marlow has working with him. Uh, this is uh, what Marlow says about uh, the gentleman on his ship. Fine fellows, uh, cannibals, in their place. There were men one could work with, and I'm grateful to them. And after all, they did not eat, eat each other before my face. So, Marlow is saying that the cannibals who, uh, who eat each other are better people than you'd expect, while the Europeans, who are supposed to be there to civilize, um, are worse people, right? They're, they're the donkeys, and the cannibals are, are fine fellows. Now, why is there this distinction? Because they both, they both seem like they don't do terribly pleasant things to other humans. Um, but even though the black Africans are a mere uh, for examining the white Europeans and Marlowe's descriptions of the Africans cause justifiable squeamishness for a modern audience. The fact remains that he is still examining and questioning the European action in Africa with this mirror at a time where far too few people are actually questioning what's going on there. Um, is Richard Harris uh, in a, a fantastic podcast that I'll add in the, the links uh, section down there uh, states the cannibals who go hungry uh, rather than eat their captain, show a self-restraint, while the Europeans give fully into their lust and desire. Conrad may use binary uncomfortably, but they're not designed, these binaries, to be of any detriment to the Africans or their cause. Um, they're designed to show their struggle for survival against this European invasion uh, that's going on. Uh, other events uh, that start this second chapter of the book, uh, Marlowe's sailing down the Congo, sailing, 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 and he hears drums, right? Drums that may praise, welcome, or condemn his presence, Marlowe can't tell. What he can discern from the howls and dances in the jungle is they are undeniably human. This disturbs him because he can't separate his own humanity from what he's hearing in the jungle, right? From this supposed savagery around him. Doctors at this time are measuring skulls, as we saw in uh, the Brussels section of the book. And they're doing so to try and figure out what difference is there between people who ended up civilized, in quotes, and those who aren't, right? Is, is their heads different? Is there, like, some sort of different shape to their brain? Um, Marlowe is frightened not by the differences that people believe to exist between himself and the Africans, but by the undeniable similarities. Um, he sees them as humans, right? Because they are. And that frightens him, because does that mean he's capable of, of acting in this savage uh, way. A lot of air quotes today. In this savage way, right? Uh, there they are again. Um, finally, it's important to keep in mind that while most of the characters in the text hear the word ivory ringing through the air, the spell that's cast Marlowe and forced him deeper and deeper into the heart of darkness is not ivory, uh, but a single name, that of uh, Mr. Kurtz. We're going to find out more about this guy uh, in our next video lecture. Thanks for watching.